So we're, we're in front of the DC combiner box, which is at the, uh, the back row, for want of a better expression, and the row that is closest to the SunGrow inverter. The, uh, and we'll get to the SunGrow. The SunGrow is mounted in the, in the, um, in the main switch, switch room, yeah, is that so correct? It's referred to as a pump station switch um, room on this site. Yep. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's located, I guess, opposite to the, um, to the, uh, the distribution board inside of it and connected to the distribution board as well. Yeah, and I noticed too, there's some signage um, on the uh, enclosures on the outside of the building, like generator and a manual transfer switch. And I did say to you at the start of the, when I got here, oh, where's this generator? And there ain't no generator. So that, that's, a, that's a future plan. Yeah, it's a provision. So if something goes wrong, they can drop a generator on site and just connect it temporarily to power the pump station. Yeah. Have we allowed that in our design for the future, like with an interlock, or we'll come back and do that later? No, we have. We've actually, oh, we've yeah, we have. so we've, we've incorporated um, an interlock cable uh, where we found, um, an auxiliary contact in the uh, pump station switchboard where if we if they turn their manual transfer switch on it energizes this auxiliary contact and we've, we've utilized that to then send um, some voltage to our uh, our 24 volt relay which will then disconnect our motorized circuit breakers in the PVDB. So that, that's the, the tele relay that we tend to put in a lot of our grid safe boards. And obviously the kind of relay we use is dependent on what the, the, the DNSP allows. Um, and in Victoria, they all allow the tele and it does vary from state to state. Yep. So this board, it, it, to me, it looks like it's a stainless, and I assume it's a 316 stainless, marine grade? That's correct, yes it is. Um, and it's also uh, two millimeter, uh, yeah, two millimeter stainless steel, um, which is a little bit of a higher grade than the standard uh, stainless steel switchboards. Um, it was a site requirement to have at least what, two millimeters. What, because, what, is it usually 1.6? Normally 1.6, uh, yeah. So we, well, we had to have this one made uh, a little bit bigger. Um, and it's obviously obviously stainless uh, to keep, um, I guess, keep it weather resistant. I think the switchboard was IP67 rated. Yeah, okay. Um, that's, and that's a high IP rating, yeah. It is, yeah, nothing's, nothing's getting in here, put it that way. That's good. No spiders, because I do notice there's a lot of spiders down on this site. There's a lot, we've seen a few orb weavers, weavers and things. So that, you've got like a mounting structure that you guys put together. It seems like you, you're talking about a combo of uni strut um, and like a like a cable tray, and you've attached it to the pole as well. So yes, yeah, that's right. We um, we were trying to work out the best way to mount this to one of the um, one of the pilings that we put in place, and we we ended up tapping threads into the pilings, which are approximately five millimeters thick. So there's plenty of grab in there, um, and that that attached the, uh, the uni strut to the piling and then we used a combination of um, channel strut bolts and uh, square washers to mount the um, to mount the switchboard onto that uni strut. Um, as you can sort of see, I won't touch inside the board. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's fairly going, secure. It's, not going anywhere. it's as far as I understand, it's already taken um, winds up to hundred kilometers oh, and wow. it's, it's still standing. There's no noticeable damage or anything like that. There's no signs of wear. It's done the job. It could probably handle double the weight, I think. Uh, that's yeah, that's fantastic. And obviously, there's no there's no issues with the interface between um, a hot dip galvanised steel and stainless steel, because obviously we have to in this industry we have to be very aware of the chemical compatibility between different metals. Yep. Um, so there's no issue there. So could you could, like point us through the, the different components? Obviously, these are the. Uh, DC isolators, can you just talk about a, a little bit about them and what's going on here with the wiring, etc.? Yeah, no worries. So, um, yeah, we've got our, our eight DC isolators. Um, from, you got from D DC isolator A to G, we've got two strings per isolator combining. Okay, so and then A is here and G is here. Uh, G is here. We'll talk about H in a minute. Yeah, yep. I wish I knew so, my alphabet yeah. where the letters where the letters were. Cut. Yeah, so A to G we've got um each Thanks string <laughs> A to G we've got each string um, coming into an isolator. Um, so your A1 pause, A1 uh, A2 pause, A1 neg, A2 neg. Uh, we then combine in the isolator and run back into uh, back by one feed. And we also come off of um, the bottom side 
into the surge protection devices. As well. I'll, I'll just reiterate, so we're talking about, we've got two strings coming into the isolator, yep. and then we've got one string, because one combined, feed, yep. One feed coming out yep. of the isolator and running that 50 or 60 meters yep. to the actual um, inverter. inverter. And how does the wiring here interface with these uh, these SPDs? And if you'd like to talk about them a bit as well. Yeah, so they uh, the SPDs take a positive and a negative feed. Um, so we before we go, what's what is an SPD? An SPD is a, a surge protection device. So it sort of it it works in a way where it sort of monitors any um, I guess over over current. Uh, for example, if a lightning um, strike hit the array and send a current back through the cable, it would uh, automatically divert into the SPD. But this is not a lightning, this is not specific lightning protection. No, it's a, yeah, it's a surge yes. protection. Yes. Right. Because they're two different things. That's very true. But they're sort of related. Sort of related. So we, we'd say that lightning is probably the best example of how to explain it. <laughs> yeah, as gotcha. I'd, I'd be a little bit concerned if um, any extra charge came from this. Maybe, it, maybe a short circuit could also cause um, excess current as yep. well okay. um, but yeah any anyways any any excess um, well not excess any extra if we have a, a surge current a surge of current it will flow into the SPD rather than back to the inverter um, the SPD will then I guess maybe we, we engage we can say uh, when the SPD engages it goes from the green um, little green square there or rectangle yep. it'll turn red uh, and it'll create a path to earth um, by these 25 millimeter earth cables that we've got. I can see there it's a pretty pretty thick earth yep. earthing system there yep. um, and, and so that basically it, it's it's creating an alternative pathway yep. to back to earth back to earth to reduce any potential damage to equipment. That's that's right. Yeah. And and that equipment is not necessarily necessarily just the inverter. It could be other equipment further down the line. Yeah. The that's line. right. Yeah. And that's really important, isn't it? Yeah. There's yeah. one SPD per isolator. Right. Um, they were they're 1200 volt rated. Yep. Uh, at um, pretty uh, 20 ka yep. kiloamperes. Um, that's the fault current rating. That's the fault course. current rating. Yep. Um, which should be more than sufficient for this, yeah, for most sites, really. Um, I think we, we may have gone a little bit overboard, but we just wanted to make sure that we got the best of the best here. Uh, they definitely weren't cheap, um, but we've, we just, you know, we want to protect the investment. Is this, is this, was this a stipulation in the tender docs to you, to utilize these? It was. And, yes. but do you think it's, is it like for a ground mount system, you reckon it should be a, like a standard approach in your opinion um, or, or not? I'm not sure I'd call it necessarily a, a standard approach, but we did a, um, we did a lightning protection study um, in accordance with a, in accordance with one of the Australian standards for lightning protection. I can't <laughs> remember the number of it, sorry. Yeah, no, um, no, and yeah. in that, in that, uh, in that standard, they, they actually supply um, like a calculator spreadsheet um, which is essentially a risk assessment for do you need lightning protection and uh, to what degree do we need it? So you'll, you'll input data such as, um, uh, how can I put it? Well, there's a lightning yeah. map, isn't it? That's one thing. Well, you'll, you'll incorporate a lightning map, but you'll also look at where is it? What, what are we mounting? Um, are there people around? Are there services within the area? What are the risks of like services getting damaged? Being an unmanned site, the risk to human life here is, yeah. it's not as not as severe as say a manned site. Yeah. Um, there are services here, but we're not knocking out um, services that may supply a whole town or anything like that. Do they take into consideration the geology of the ground? Because I know like in places that have a high level of basalt, like on the, if you're looking in Victoria, Australia, uh, down the southwest coast, uh, Port Ferry, Warrnambool, there's a lot of uh, a lot of basalt, a lot of floaters, and they have a real trouble. They have a lot of trouble getting earth down there. Yep. Would that play a role in the design of, of, of the of the earthy, earthing system in general and, and sur the surge protection as well? Yeah. So soil soil resistance uh, does get taken into account. Um, I'm not a I'm not a geoengineer, yep. unfortunately, so I can't sort of comment too much on it. Yep. Um, 
but these posts being you know 2.34 meters into the ground yes. and we've we've also upsized the cable so it was um a minimum 16 millimeter cable to carry the fault current to earth um we decided to upsize it to 25 just yeah. to give it that little bit that's less right. and yeah just play it safe that, that's i mean hey it is electricity after all yeah. isn't it it's so we've got um the uh the stencil hazardous dc voltage yep. and we've got the pit here and um uh, Jake did show me before what's going on in the pit and there's a lot going on. Now, here's, there's an interesting scenario. It's not just electricity in this pit, is it? I mean, we're talking there's comms because we've got a weather station on here. Yeah, that's right. So we've um, we've opted to run our eight six millimeter squared um, DC cables plus our, our earth, our um, bonding earth back to the uh, main switchboard in a 63 mil conduit 63 mil conduit 63 millimeter yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. which was oversized to be honest yeah, but um yeah, yeah. it was best for a big pool but we've also run a 40 millimeter conduit uh with just our one instrumentation cable um which was a, a single uh sorry it was a two pair instrumentation cable um that runs to our weather station so one pair is for the data of the weather station the other pair is to supply a uh, 24 volt supply to it um it was an excessive size conduit yeah. for, yeah, it, for it. To pull through. it was a lot easier to pull through. Um, I mean, look, we could have run a 25 mil or a 20 mil conduit yeah, if we right, really wanted right. to, but it would have made this job a bit of a nightmare. So right, we, we right. thought we'd just keep it uniform. Yeah, and why not? Yeah. And the, the reason why the comms is not in the same conduit as electricity is due to various reasons and then they are. Well, as follows. Yeah, as yeah. follows, yeah. So look, we, we probably could have uh, if we chose to. So 24 volt uh, DC would be ELV mixing with, uh, or being in the same conduit as, DC, uh, as yeah, LV DC. I think the AS3000 book says that, um, oh, sorry, AS3000 regulation says that you can actually put them in the same um, conduit provided that uh, the insulation on the, I'm pretty sure it's the insulation on the lower, um, on the ELV is double insulated. And is this because of electromagnetic um, fields affecting yep, the- Yep, the EMI, yep, yeah, the yeah, EMI, yeah, EMF, yeah, yep. Yeah. But in saying that, uh, we're also shielded as well. Um, oh, instrumentation okay. cable has shielding, so that, that further protects it. Um, however, we just decided to run it in a separate, um, separate conduit, as that just seems to be, um, our general standard. Um, so we could have done it, but we yep. just, we decided to separate it just to make sure. It, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yep. Um, and this, we haven't, have we made provision for uh, extending this site in regards to the size of the remote conduit? I mean, it, it, are they even thinking of adding another array behind here or going that way in the future? Uh, have they talked about that? Yeah, so there is, um, there is possibility to I guess expand on the sizing if it's required. Mm -hmm. um, we we have a bit of room left in the DC conduits if we decide to try and run um, a snake through, yep. or I guess make a, a different. Uh, we we do have that 40 millimeter conduit too, which has only got an instrumentation yeah. cable, which yeah, we can right. also run our DC through if we choose to. Gotcha. Um, we might have to make a couple of changes with this um, P, uh, with the combiner box. There are two isolators left, meaning yep. that we could probably put four strings or we could incorporate fusing um, and maybe do six yeah, if we chose okay. to. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit of room further up uh, if we were to put another array there or a little bit further back if we wanted to as well. Um, but for now, I think this, the 100 kilowatt solar and 100 kilowatt battery is definitely a sufficient size. 